Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Cedric Geffen. I'm the president of March of the Living Australia, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to what I'm sure will be another riveting presentation in this March of the Living Australia's 15th online event this year. You see a photograph of our guest speaker here this evening, Richard Haber, taken in Birkenau in Auschwitz as we wait to start the journey that I shared with, with uh, Richard in 2015. It is an absolute pleasure to be able to have Richard join us here this evening. And I won't go into too long an introduction, but I can assure you that this is going to be an absolutely riveting presentation to hear his perspective. It is time to have some perspective on life as it actually is today. And perhaps things are not as bad as everyone makes them out to be. Imagine that you were born in the year 1900. The first 13 years of your life are relatively uneventful and very peaceful. And on the day that you turn 14 years old, the world decides to go to war for the next four years of your life. By the time you turn 18, over 22 million people will have died in World War I. In that same year, a disease called the Spanish Flu descends on the earth and runs until you turn 20. All over the world, over 50 million people will die in those two years from the Spanish Flu. On your 29th birthday, the stock market crashes and announces the beginning of the Great Depression. Unemployment hits 30% and scarcity and fear takes hold of our mindsets. America nearly collapses along with the world economy. On your 39th birthday, World War II starts. On December 7th, 1941, just after you turned 41 years old, the United States is fully pulled into World War II. From the time of your 39th birthday until you turn 45 years old, 75 million people will die in World War II. When you turn 50, the Korean War starts and it will last until you turn 53 and 5 million more people will die in the Korean War. From your birth until you are 55, you have dealt with the fear of polio. Over half a million people die every year due to polio. A cure was only found in 1955. Smallpox was an ongoing epidemic until you were in your 50s and it killed 300 million people during your lifetime. When you turn 55, the Vietnam War begins and doesn't end for the next 20 years. When you reached your 60th birthday, it was the time of the Cold War. You lived each day with the fear of nuclear destruction and the fear that life would end as we know it. When you turn 75, the Vietnam War finally ends, during which 4 million people died. Imagine being born in 1900. How did they live through all of that? When you were a kid in 1985 or 1995 or 2005, and you didn't think your grandparents understood how tough life was at school for you, please remember, your great-grandparents and your grandparents were called to endure all of the above. Today, you're called to stay at home, watch Netflix, Amazon Prime, overeat, and sit on your couch in the freedom of your own home. Let's keep things in perspective and be grateful for the liberties the peace and the freedom that we have in the year 2020. Hello everyone, my name is Jason Silverstone and thanks Cedric for the introduction. 
look forward to this evening or today's discussions with Richard Haber. We're going to talk about Richard's journey through, through life and uh, in the 1940s, what he went through and what his family went through. We're going to use today's times with COVID and the different world in which we live as a frame of reference, but we'll not be discussing the merits of vaccination and the validity of COVID uh, and how we exist uh, in, in that uh, respect. We're here to hear from and learn much from Richard, who's got so much richness to share with us. So I'd like to uh, introduce the topic and then we'll be handing over to Richard and we'll have a, a really in-depth discussion. As Cedric said, at the end, we will uh, have an opportunity for people to submit questions and then have uh, in-depth discussion thereafter. So I'd just like to start with a word cloud from uh, COVID and the world in which we live today. So when we look at this word cloud, there are a number of words here that just 18 months ago almost didn't exist in the vernacular. Today, they're very commonplace. We talk every day about uh, being uh, quarantined, being shut down. Social distancing is a new term that was uh, thrust upon us last year. Everyone knows what PPE is. We talk about N95 masks and different masks and the like. We are doing this call on Zoom, which was foreign to us uh, all too recently. Moving along. What, uh, from an Australian perspective, here are a few images that illustrate the world in which we live. We have had various lockdowns at different times. We've had the entire country in lockdown at different at points. We have seen and had to endure wearing masks. And life is certainly different today to what it was prior to the pandemic being upon us. We have uh, images here from uh, an elderly gentleman who was maybe less willing to adapt his ways and being asked to leave the beach during a snap lockdown in Melbourne uh, earlier this year. And we have images of people having gone out on beautiful nature walks, uh, even whilst in lockdown. We've also all seen protests on the news and we've also seen the police having to enforce law and order uh, in the interests of public health and safety. Uh, Sydney ciders have, uh, it's almost become a daily ritual at 11 a.m. we all await the daily figures from Gladys Berejiklian and her team. How many cases, how many vaccinations, what percentage, that has now become literally something that many of us uh, partake in every single day. In the news, what we've seen, we've seen certain comments from politicians and other people with comparisons of today's times to Nazi Germany and subsequent apologies in the public light, uh, whether forced or, or really meant is, is up for debate. We've also had people who have denied that COVID exists, uh, some of whom have subsequently landed in hospital and then suddenly validated COVID as uh, being viral induced horrible disease and, and conditions that ensued. When we look and compare and contrast today's time and today's word cloud with the following word cloud, we see the distinct difference in contrast. So when we look at this, that is a word cloud to describe the 1940s and the Holocaust, there are words like genocide, gas or gas chambers, Cyclone B, which is the horrific gas used in the gas chambers, ovens, Auschwitz, World War II, illegalities, crematorium, and many, many other words that describe that horrible time in, in, in history. I would now, now like to uh, engage Richard Haber, who's uh, our guest and honored guest for this evening. Uh, and Richard has a very interesting story, which really has three components through which we will walk through and discuss. And the first of these is uh, Richard's time in the Krakow ghetto and subsequently uh, in captivity in a home in Poland. And then we're going to talk about Richard's uh, family and his own experience uh, with the, uh, the, the gas chambers uh, from a family perspective and the camps. And as I said earlier, there are many, many lessons that we can learn from Richard. So I have a few images, but Richard, if you can pick it up now, I'd love to hear from you about your experience as a young boy in the, the ghetto in Krakow, what it was like on a daily basis, what, what happened, what, what discussions there were, what people were feeling in the different camps of people, some with different outlooks. 
If you can uh, run us through some of that and we can uh, delve deeper into that subsequently, thank you. If you look at the history of the Krakow ghetto, there are, it is not just one stable situation. It really consisted of the beginning and the later part. In the beginning, we were just locked in in terms of, with not within five kilometers of our area, but within the walls of the ghetto, which is much smaller than the five kilometers that is used today. Now, during the initial time, for practical purposes, life appeared normal, other than the fact that we were locked up within that area. We could do whatever we wanted. Most people had to go to work, either within or outside the ghetto, and life appeared to be reasonably normal within the borders of the ghetto until a, nearly a year later, or good part of a year later, that the first axia took place. What happened then, a lot of people were taken by force and made to leave the ghetto to a destination that nobody knew what it is. At that stage, the situation was in a way and I'm not trying to compare it with what's happening today, but there were three type of people attitude. On the one hand, people were saying and thinking we haven't heard from anybody. There was no mail or no, no communication secret or otherwise. These people must have been killed. Otherwise we would have heard what happened to them. And there were people who were saying, ah, what? are you talking about? This is Germany, a cultured nation who would never kill anybody without a good reason. And there was a third group who was saying, well, who knows? Maybe we will be killed and maybe we're not. And these were the sort of halfway between. But after the first axia as it was, people were started to wonder where, what is going to happen. And obviously we were close in and not able to move out. You want me to talk about what happened then, then when we left the ghetto? Yes, I'd also be interested in, uh, if I move on to the next slide, just uh, visually, if we look at these walls, what, what were they meant to depict and, and make you feel living within these walls? Looking back, if you look at the walls that surrounded, they were all made with concrete and bricks. They were practically double the height of the average person, myself, in, well, obviously an um, adult person. And obviously it looked as if it was uh, cemetery, and that was the sort of feeling which we did not initially realize that that is the feeling that the Germans on purpose did it. Richard, what, what did you get up to on a daily basis inside the ghetto? Well, by that stage, I was nearly 10 years of age. I could read and write, not having been to school for Let's go one step back. When the Germans moved in, within six weeks or so, all the Jews were not allowed to go to school. And luckily, there was a lady who taught me how to read and write. So at least I learned how to read and write. So when we were locked up in the ghetto, there was no schooling. There was not, not, nobody was there to teach because my parents had to do slave labor. So Luckily, from my point of view, my uncle, or distant uncle, who was a doctor in the ghetto, sort of general practitioner working for the, for the company in the ghetto. And I was working there as a secretary, pulling out the files, letting people in, and, and just as a receptionist type of attitude. 
Was that the first time that you decided you want to do one day become a doctor, what you had seen then? Well, having been so much in touch with medicine so early in the piece and, you know, seeing people att being attempted by a doctor without any medicine or anything else, trying to help people that somehow or other that I was infused with the idea of becoming a doctor, yes. But that's miles later in my, in my life. Yes, I'm going to play a short video clip. Thank you. Just the ir irony, I can't. what was a funeral stone hmm? for the ghetto wall is now a playground. Oh yes, that, that's... So, so Richard, that's the, the very same ground uh, in which you were held captive with inside the ghettos now being turned into a playground for Polish children. Yes. It's somewhat ironic. So uh, Richard, we're going to, we will have it, an opportunity to discuss this further, but in the interest of time, I think I wanted to move on to the next part of your journey when you had escaped from the, the ghetto Maybe you can talk us through how you got out of the ghetto and then we can move into this video clip. If you can put up that slide, it shows you the, how the ghetto was surrounded at one stage. Initially, the ghetto was surrounded by concrete walls that you could not jump across. But because of the actia reducing the number of the people in the ghetto, um, and the Germans, we did not realize, realized that the reduced size of the ghetto is only temporary before it closed altogether. So one part of the ghetto became closed only by barbed wire, which I was hoping you would be able to show because uh, thanks to the, the fact that it was wire, I was able to lift this wire up when the final action came along and moved under the uh, wire and ran out of the ghetto. Luckily, I was younger than 12 years of age. So at that stage, you, only the Jews 12 years or older had to wear the armband. And I did not wear one. I didn't have to wear one. And therefore, I could get away and go to a woman that was willing for us to stay at, in, at a place temporarily when we ra ran out of the ghetto. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I'm going to play this video, Richard, and after that we can talk about your time in the home in, in uh, Koshioka. This is where I, I, I was with the other kids, relatives to them played here. And never, never did I go, I only went once out of this house for a haircut. And the kids started to run, zit, zit, zit. So, so how, long were you here for? Hmm? how long were you here for? Nearly a year. Okay. And you said you, you played in the yard? Yes, well, that's as far as I could go. Yeah, yeah. I said that there was a big table here. Yeah. And when we saw anybody coming through, we just hit under the table. Exactly. Okay. And, then, and then, of course, his grandmother did not suspect that we too. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> not. Normally, my grandmother, if somebody came to her, uh, speak with them in the kitchen. It was a, a meeting point in this house, and mm -hmm. everybody who came, neighbor or uh, uh, seller so, of potatoes, or of uh, um, anybody came usually to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. to, and they met in the kitchen, but uh, I understand he has to be silently here because it was on the one door. So your parents were here also? My mother. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So no, my father went to work. I, oh, okay. Uh, it, he went it's, to work. Uh, his, no, his father, I, they all have a, a, a false documents uh, uh -huh. to uh, name Haberko. Not Haber, but Haberko. His father would change name in this uh, documents too. He was no Henrik in, in this document, but Adam. And he worked in Krakow, yeah. uh, uh, but he as a child usually play in this, uh, in this yeah. playground, <laughs> but he can't go to school, for example, yeah. Yeah. and he were uh, here or on this 
courtyard. Yeah. It was. No, no, it was I, I'm I trying to find the point where, at which point I jump for safety. Uh, no, no, when the kids were chasing me, I, I ran back. For example, what, uh, I did faster 100 meters than any other sportswoman. <laughs> It makes sense. With you. It makes sense that this was our bedroom. Yeah. We would, would see anybody coming. Yeah. And this was the. It's it's possible. The but the, the um, get the number. Dining room. If you said that there's a hot in the balcony. The balcony went further. Yeah. You see, I went. For, I went to to my mother after months. Decided that I should go and, and have a haircut. Mm -hmm. I went for the haircut, and the kids said, "Jit, jit, jit," mm -hmm. and, and started to run after me. And there was a woman on the street. He said, "Go back." Mm -hmm. It was very nice of her. So that gave me a chance to run. By the time they organized themselves, I was already mm -hmm. disappeared and ran, In the ran here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it makes sense that we would see people coming here, and we would hide under the table there. Was was dangerous when German uh, caught us. I'm sure they uh, killed not only these families but from the other side of this building too, because they said it's impossible. They didn't know, and I'm sure they kill uh, people from the other uh, s yeah. half of this house too. Richard. Um, that was a very insightful clip of your time in the home. I'd be very interested if you could uh, elaborate on what life was like on a daily basis. I think from the video clip, I could glean that you were staying in one room with your parents, a small room, that you were always uh, on guard to see if people were coming near the house and you needed to hide. But if you could please explain your daily existence, what you were able to do, what you were unable to do, and then that vivid memory you have of going out for a haircut that turned out to be a really harrowing experience. Um, from March of, of 43 to, to January 1944, we were just in one place, as you saw here. Um, it really consisted of the lounge room, and bedroom, and we stayed most of the time in the bedroom. If anybody walked in the place that we could, that could see us, we just jump, jump under the table or to cover up, not to be seen. My, the the man that was talking, is the son of the woman who saved us. Essentially, looking back, while we were in the ghetto, my mother met one of the Christian women was working in the ghetto and coming every day to the ghetto to work in the factory. She, for no good reason, agreed that if we were able to escape from the ghetto, that we could stay with her mother in a township called Yelichka. The man that spoke to you is the Christian who is the son of this woman who allowed us to, to go there. And as he described clearly, our limitation of the space was just the two rooms and the backyard. And there were some children who were part of the family who were allowed to play with me, sometimes in the backyard, which was a very small backyard. But outside of this, I did not go out at all from that unit. But after a few months, my mother decided quite sensibly, according to most women of, of today, that you've got a long hair and you better go for a haircut. So off I went to the fair cut, haircut, and on the road, there were some kids who started, I don't know how they realized I'm Jewish, but it started to say, jit, 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 ju, ju. And I thought, that's the end of me. Luckily, there was a Christian woman who was walking on the street and told them to turn around and go back. I went in the opposite direction, ran into the house, probably as fast as any of the 100 meter experts in, in uh, running. 
And through the window, my mother dragged me into it. And we then, for the next few days, were wondering whether anybody found out where I jumped in or, or, the, or, or mentioned anything. But that was my one and only movement out of the small unit. We did not have television. We did not have radio. We did not have newspapers. We had nothing to, to, to do for practical purposes. My mother had a look Jewish, and so do I, as you can see. And so we stayed in the house. My father had blue eyes and a mustache and, and was working as a draftsman in the local factory there. And, and, and he did all the shopping and everything else. But as far as I was concerned, my limitation was in the unit or at best outside. And that was from nearly from March to January of next following year. Thank you. That was uh, locked down to a whole new level, uh, you know, in terms of drawing a parallel. Th thank you for sharing that, Richard. I'm, I'm going to move on to the next slide, or the next uh, part of the journey now. So this would focus on not necessarily your own experience, but your family's experience in the camps and your near experience. If you could just please recount that for the audience. Just before we go any further, because the things that I'm learning 70 years later about what happened earlier is absolutely amazing. Yeah. I come up to a very important thing, but while we were in that small township, firstly, the only in Poland, it was that whoever kept Jews, the whole family would be shot. And if, if it is in a village, the neighbors would be shot as well because they should have seen what's happening and they should have denounced us. So this is, we must remember that these people risk not only their own lives by being good to us, but their family life and also the neighbor, neighbors. And only this week, I've learned something of interest, that there was an underground, Polish underground, who organized a number of things to help Jews to survive. One of them, they, they had experts on certain things. One of them is to produce false papers, because my parents, got papers that they were baptized under a different name, of course, and that they were working somewhere where they never worked. So they had lots of false papers to prove their different identity. And only this week, I got a book about it from Poland they, with this description by, of the organization that was called Zegota. However, that's it's just, by the way, going back two steps back, going forward. When we um, realized the big danger of staying in Poland and hiding with this lady, um, to make a long story short, my parents found out a way to escape to a safe spot called Hungary. So we had to go through the um, two mountain ranges out from, from the southern part of Poland to uh, Hungary. We arrived there, and within two months of arriving to Hungary, the Germans walked in, and the whole st business started all over again. Uh, when we were, uh, when we arrived to Hungary before the Germans arrived, we were put to a camp with po Polish people in Hungary. There was a camp for them just to keep us, and whether they were Jewish or not Jewish, they were all put together. When the Germans mar marched in, the, uh, the whole things started all over again, trying to find who, who are the Jews and to kill them in due course. We were then denounced as Jews, and to make a long story short, we were caught, we said were sent to another camp, which was only for the Jews. And that camp was in uh, 
also in Hungary, where there were also a Polish Jewish army people. But the Germans decided that they were not acceptable as prisoners of war, they were just Jews, so we were just put with them. And we, at, at one stage, they decided to march us from the camp to somewhere. We then realized that the place that we would be going to, we suspected strongly, but we did not know, but it was something which turned out to be Auschwitz. And we were then taken on a, a Polish army guys, or Jewish Polish army guys marched, whereas I was on the put on its truck. And we were marched towards what we knew was some death camp, but it turned out that we were on the way to um, Auschwitz. Only a few months ago, no, a year or two years ago, I learned why we were ma made to march rather than put on trucks or, on, or trains. And the point was that at that very time, and that's how lucky we were so many times during, this, during the war, at that very time, Eichmann was told there were no available trains for him because of the need for the army, for the German army. And so that's why they marched us. And while they marched us, one night we stayed in a barn, which was poorly supervised, and we were able to escape and ran away, caught the train, went back to Budapest on false papers again. And again, um, we were locked up in that building because at that time, the Budapest was under the um, Russian um, bombardment, and it took six weeks before it, the Russians actually took over that part of Budapest we were staying in. So during that time, again, we were locked in the one building all the time. Richard, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So from your personal perspective, thank God you never made it to the, the death camps, but uh, many in your family were not as fortunate. Well, I was very lucky that throughout my occupation, German occupation and during the war, I was with my parents all the time. <coughs> but unfortunately, I have do not remember ever seeing my grandparents. None of them survived the war. I do not know my uncle. I do not know his family. They all died. Um, so for practical purposes, only the, what is called the nuclear families survived with it, my parents and I. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. So these few images were taken by your son, Mark Haber during a visit to Auschwitz in the last few years. Obviously the, the piercing steel and the barbed wire and uh, nowhere to move really depict the atrocities of the time. So Richard, thank you for, for sharing that, that personal journey. I'm going to move the discussion here, looking at the following. So there are a number of uh, so-called parallels, but many, many stark differences between today's times and those times. So in today's times we have I guess, uh, camps in which there are COVID deniers. You've spoken earlier about uh, the Holocaust deniers, those uh, Jewish people who were kind of in denial that they were in danger and that, that life had changed uh, for a very long period for some. Today, we, we're all uh, aware of the anti-vaxxers um, and you have described in discussion that the, many people around at the time, some people responded, some people didn't respond well to the danger. Um, some people denied it, some people accepted it, some people were hysterical with fear. So there were very multiple different responses to, to the situation. Today we, we read about, we see protests happening. Then you could argue that there were far too 
far too few protests where many people turned a blind eye to what was happening. Today, we see police involvement and there are accusations of uh, there being a police state even here in Australia. When we look at the role played by the police to try and enforce law and order and trying to maintain public health and safety, when we compare and contrast that to the role played by the SS in a fascist state, uh, and as you can see from the image there, mass killings, indiscriminate shootings and burials without graves, without dignity, people shot for no valid apparent reason. So whilst there are a few parallels, there are distinct differences between the now and then. So Richard, I'm, I'm going to move into the next section just in the interest of time. So we have a bit of time at the end for questions. So the slide before, we, we have an image here of one of the, the worst times in, in human history with uh, absolute barbaric behavior. And this uh, image is very cutting and piercing. So if I fast forward two slides, I've got a, a very stark contrast to what I've shown you earlier. So I've entitled this in the next two slides, 87 years young. And why I've done that is, is having spent a bit of time with you and having photographed you at different functions like this one. So this is a recent bar mitzvah in the family. So there is, it's apparent from this image that you have an incredible zest for life and, in, and an exuberance about you, despite your, your, um, your you know, your 87 years young is, is probably the best way of describing it. So when we look at this image, we look at that image, there's so much life in your eyes and um, you can see there's joy uh, depicted in everyone's faces in this image and, and in the third one too. Um, I'm going to play a very short video clip and then I'd like to ask you a few questions. So my girlfriend was for my play in the, in the backyard of Yelichka. Do you remember? Yes, you remember? I, I, I recognize her, it's, yes. <laughs> Except that she was blonde. But then I had more hair as well. So I guess despite everything you've been through, everything you've seen, you maintain a positive outlook and a zest for life at uh, the ripe old age of uh, 80, 88 years old now. So I'd just really like to ask you a few questions. Um, one being whether you feel that what you went through as a, as a young boy and, and then in your teens, if that's helped and shaped your outlook on life and your, your motto and, and the way you view things. Uh, and then also if you feel that, you know, it bred a lot of resilience. But over and above that, I'd really love to uh, hear some of your pearls of wisdom your, what, the way you look at the world, which uh, is something from which I think we could all learn. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that, about how your, your form formative years shaped your thinking and some of what you've discussed with me, like you say, you don't hate anyone, you don't, you, uh, you're not imprisoned by your past, but some of those what I regard to be absolute pearls of wisdom, if you could please share them, Richard. Look, my attitude is I do not hate anybody. Uh, people say I hate Poles. I feel it's so unfair. There are bad people amongst in every nation. And what I, my experiences were, I was very lucky that for practical purposes, well, obviously I have survived and I have survived thanks to quite a few Poles, risking either their life or at least closing their eyes while, while I was escaping and every, everything. So I do not feel that I have to hate Poles because they were bad Poles, because there were some who risked their lives to save us. And so that's one of the things. My other attitude is to be optimistic in any situation and to move on and not to look back as I never had time to look back until in my relative retirement, because I'm not fully retired at all, um, that I have time to look back and think about what happened in the past and try to explain what happened. So my attitude is to move on, don't look at the past, think positively, try not to hate anybody and enjoy as much life as you can. It's a great outlook. And I know you mentioned we, we shouldn't forget. And, you know, events like this are 
precisely to ensure that many people uh, are aware of the atrocities that happened. We teach the younger generations about them, but we move on and, not, and are not imprisoned by our past in trying to live today and tomorrow. I think that's a great life lesson. Genos unfortunately, genocide, we feel very strongly because it affected us. But there were so many nations since the Second World War that were subjected to genocide and the world just turned around and that, that doesn't yeah. look or do anything or can't do or, not, or does not want to do anything. And even today, you can see what is happening in Afghanistan. Yeah. Lessons not learned. Richard, no, thank you. Yes. I'm, I'm going to conclude with two slides so that we'll have uh, opportunity for questions. So I'm going to, this is a, a personal slant and things from me. So this slide is, is all about perspective and so too is the next one. And this is entitled, The Lens Through Which You Look Determines What You See. Those who know me know that I'm quite a keen photographer. So I've got three pictures and I'd like to illustrate a few points with them. This is a picture taken in lockdown where I think myself and many of my photography friends out there have uh, resorted to, you know, we can't go out and travel and uh, go across the world uh, photographing different and exotic places. So it's forced us amongst many other things to look a little bit closer to home, literally in your garden and in, in the streets around you. So this is a picture taken last year and it's of a rainbow lorikeet that was going about its business upside down now, we all might have felt at the time that our lives were turned upside down. So I remember seeing this bird and thinking, wow, this bird is just adept at doing things 180 degrees flipped from what we would regard as normal. And then fast forward 18 months, we've all had to do that in some way, shape or form. So I thought it had quite a bit of relevance. The picture on the left, this is a dandelion, which is it, essentially it's a weed. It's, it offers little value in terms of the ecosystem. Uh, you can look at it as a useless weed or you put on a macro lens, get up close to it, and it's actually quite beautiful in the right light. So the lens through which you look determines what you see, I think is very pertinent there. And then the last picture is two flowers that came from my garden on a rainy day with droplets of water. I don't normally photograph flowers, but I guess, uh, as, as I say, when you're confined to home at times, you end up doing things differently. And that leads to the, the following in the box, which is a, a Jewish concept, which I've recently learned, learned about, which is dan lekaf zechut, which is judging favorably, which may require us to step back and look at a situation or person in a different light. So I think we've all had to do that at times in the last 18 months. So I thought I'd just share that. And I'm gonna close off the presentation with a poem that I came across quite recently. It was written last year, in light of the COVID situation. So I'm going to read it um, for those who have small screens and anyone who wants to read it on your own, that's perfect. So the poem is entitled Pandemic and it goes as follows. What if you thought, what if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath, the most sacred of times, cease from travel, cease from buying and selling, give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray, Touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in, in another's hands. Surely that has become clear. Do not reach out your hands. Reach out your heart. Reach out your words. Reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we shall live. So I thought I'd conclude on that because the, today's discussion has been a lot about perspective. So we started and ended with uh, quite a poignant message about something putting in, in perspective. So that concludes the presentation. And I'm going to hand back to Cedric, who should be able to moderate the, the Q&A session. I'd just like to thank Richard for a really engaging discussion. Thank you, Richard. And uh, hope you all found that story useful and enlightening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason and Richard. I'm, uh, I'm going to 
open up for questions now. And uh, what I'm going to suggest, uh, because um, I've received only a couple, what I would like to suggest is that if anyone um, would like to uh, ask Richard a question, make a comment, uh, I would suggest that you uh, put that through in the chat or alternatively um, on the raise hand section of uh, the screen at the bottom. But in the meantime, I'm going to pose a question per, that was put forward by Karen Lachner. And that is to Richard. Richard, what actually motivated the family? You mentioned that for some unknown reason, but in your discussions with the family that hid you with a son, that when you went back and you had those conversations and you went into the house, what was it that actually motivated them to show you that act of kindness, to risk their lives, to go about uh, doing something which is clearly an act of, of uh, not only altruism, but, but her heroism, uh, possibly even madness. Um, so have you, have you delved into that further with the family? Well, the people that saved us obviously were no longer there. This, this was the son of this young lady. This was purely a, a human being with human heart. Not of steel, but feeling sorry for what she was seeing and, and feeling happy that she could help somebody. And I don't see that there was any greater motivation than a human soul. Unbelievable. Fantastic. And another question. Always wonder. Uh, um, yeah. Sorry, Richard, go ahead. No, I always wonder how many Jews would risk their lives for other people like this in this similar situation. And that's why I feel that one should not hate a whole nation because some people were bad, because there were some people who risked their lives and are now recognized post-mortem, generally speaking, by the um, um, Yad Vashem. Yep, fantastic. And Richard, on another tack, um, you as a Holocaust survivor, and um, Jason outlined a little bit about the, the different perspectives and some of the parallels. What are your personal feelings about the pandemic? How have you coped during the pandemic? What do you feel about it? Pandemic is very much is very much a sort of similar situation. Will I be killed by this, or is it not going to affect me? So it's is the same sort of attitude that we had before. Will I or will I not suffer as a result of it? It's open situation. I do. I mean, at the, unfortunately, at the moment, it became politicized rather than purely as a illness that has to be coped with. Personally, from the point of view of being locked up, I have no great problem with that. I've got my work uh, cut out. Um, for me, it's not being locked up. If you can go out for a, to, sh to do shopping, you can go and see a doctor, you can go and exercise, and you can go for and walk for hours if you want to. This is not being locked up for my, for my personal from my personal point of view, that's that's being that's being um, careful, people. But I do feel sorry for those who have a very small place without a backyard and and not able to move out. So it does affect people in a very different way. And some people I can understand being very badly affected. Personally, I'm not. Yep. Thank you. Um, I saw a gentleman. Uh, raise his hand physically. I think your name is uh, Henry Eckert. Did you have a question? Thank I have you. a comment. I was in the ghetto in Przemysl and during the war I was in Krakow and I was hidden in Krakow just like uh, Richard. And like Richard, I was saved by a Polish family who saved not only me but my mother and father right through the war. 
And after the war, we went back to Przemysl and escaped from Poland because of terrible anti-Semitism and eventually came here. So I just oh, wanted really? to say to Richard that I'm very grateful for what he said. And I agree with every word that he said, including that one should not hate anyone. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Henry. How did came to Australia? How did Richard come to Australia? Well, luckily, um, there was a gentleman by the name of Mark, Michael Eisner, who was in Australia before the war and who, who guaranteed for us and got our visa for us. So we were very lucky that somebody did guarantee for us and, and arrange for us to be able to come to Australia. But at the time that we came, it was a question of where can we go? Thank you. Henry, did you have another question? Go ahead. What ship did Richard come on to Australia? Partizanka. Richard, I was on the Partizanka yeah. also. <laughs> oh, that's Let amazing. Let me tell you about the Partizanka because it may interest some people. There was a boat in America that was put for for scrap, but a Yugoslav company saw it, bought the bought the boat, and used it to to bring in migrants from Europe to Australia. So cool. During our trip, which took six weeks, we went through a type near the typhoon, and eight hundred people, I think, were on our on our boat, and we we nearly perished from the typhoon. Which we, which the captain told us after when we arrived in Sydney that we were very lucky that we survived because he was very worried that we may not come through. Richard, so I've been lucky many times in my life, and this was just another time. Yep, Henry. Richard, have you got a son called Paul who is a doctor? <laughs> yes, I do. I have two and sons and a daughter. Your, your son's wife works with my Michelle. son in Sydney at the Children's Cancer Center Institute. <laughs> the world is small, but Michelle is doing a tremendous job. And I would not be surprised if she, together with others, were getting a Nobel Prize because they are doing some amazing work. Yeah, uh, I Hopefully. Alavai, um, I'm going to thank you for that, Henry. Um, I'm going to ask another question, uh, and this is a question from a gentleman by the name of Phil Lipschitt. And um, Richard and many others in the audience obviously have been back to Poland. Um, and the question is, how do you feel about the current, on the one hand, you mentioned obviously that one should not generalize and there are good people and there are less good people uh, for want of another word. Um, but there is a revisionist view on the Holocaust currently in Poland. And the question is, how do you feel about that, Richard? What you're asking is an excellent question. And my answer is not going to be very good at all. The whole point is this, the present government is very right wing under the influence of the church. So there is a certain amount of anti-Semitism arising from this. What they've done is to declare by law that nobody can claim things that were left by, the, by them or their parents and therefore nobody can claim what is, was theirs. Um, so therefore there is a strong feeling against that law. I think personally that Israel overreacted to this law and it's now on very much um, fighting between the two governments. The whole thing is that law for practical purpose meant nothing because who can claim 70 years later something that was left there? And so 
nobody had, would have had that chance. It was just a law that pleased them to, to sort of say, we stop just trying to get anything. But because it's a useless law, but unfortunately it started very much fight between Israel and Poland, which is one of the few countries that in the United Nations and, and as part of the um, European Union were still very much supportive of Israel. So I feel very sorry that it is now happening what it is. And from what I understand that they may not allow model to come in. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I just heard it on the grapevine. So it's anti-Semitism is, as somebody said, 2000 years old, and you can't stop it suddenly. And unfortunately, we have to live with it and fight it as much as we can. Richard, like we were saying earlier, there's no vaccination for anti-Semitism. It's yeah. a disease worse than a virus, and in, in fact, people already at childbirth. Yep. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mark, Richard's son, to comment on uh, something that he put through to the chat. Um, so Richard, uh, Mark, would you mind uh, talking to that or getting talking with your dad about that? Oh, hi. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, th I think um, Hayley especially wanted to mention um, something uh, very interesting. My father was actually the only single survivor of the, um, of the um, hospital in, in the ghetto. And the Richard, story. do you want to just explain the background to that, if you don't mind? So we've got some uh, better yeah. clarity on that. <clears throat> during the war, while I, we were in the ghetto, as, as I told you, life initially in the ghetto was pretty well organized, I must say. And there was a hospital for ordinary hospital in the ghetto itself. While we were there, I developed uh, appendicitis. And I had appendix operation one day. And my mother, who had contact with the Jewish policemen within the ghetto, was told that the following day they have to appear at the hospital. And therefore, he is suspicious of what bad things are likely to be happening. To make a long story short, my mother in the middle of the night on, on the night of the of, after the operation on the cold day uh, of winter day as they are very cold in in Krakow uh, carried me out home home I mean the the unit that we lived in um, next morning everybody from the uh, hospital was literally dragged down put on the trucks including like a bag of like a sack a woman who was delivering a baby was thrown on the truck and everybody was driven out on the truck and killed and i am the only one survivor and uh, when we were seeing the ghetto with one of the guides the guide said here it is this was the the um, hospital and everybody was killed there one day when and I said, I, 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 I was there, but I'm, I was taken out in the middle of the night. And she actually was in tears when she heard that. So yep. that's quite a story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, ladies and gentlemen, are there any other questions that uh, anyone would like to pose to Richard? I'm Henry's wife, and Richard has a son, Paul. And we have a son, Paul. And Paul works with Richard's daughter-in-law in a senior position of research at the Children's Institute. We met Paul at our Paul's place and I organized to have a photograph of the Patajenka sent to Patizanka. him. Patazanka, the ship. Did he receive it? Richard, did you see did you receive the photograph? I do have a photograph of the Partizanka. I sent it to you, Richard. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. 
Uh, what a small world. What a small world. What That's small amazing. World. Which, which leads, me, leads me to conclude this, uh, this session by saying that um, the beauty of, or the value, not the beauty, the value of having survivors accompany us on the program on March of the Living is one can't put words to the value that one can derive from it. And not just because of the facts and figures, but by virtue of being able to imbibe part of the spirit of that person. And I can tell you that when Richard accompanied the student program in 2015, together with his granddaughter, Millie, and his daughter, it, Yvonne. Sorry? Yvonne? Yvonne. Um, yeah. I sat in on some of the sessions at night when the students would talk or listen to, to Richard's stories. And they were literally spellbound, absolutely spellbound, not by the facts and figures, but by the outlook, by the vision by the feeling and the um, heartfelt menshevikness of the man. And these are the messages that, he, that Richard uh, passed on to the students. The one, the messages of being, having a positive outlook, always looking on the bright side, not forgetting, not forgetting, possibly forgiving, certainly not hating, not having hatred towards anyone else, but for caring and having a heart made of feeling and not of stone. And those moments where the children or the students listened and imbibed those messages were, was the most uplifting moments of the entire experience. So, Listening to Richard this evening talk about the perspective that he has on life in general, the perspective of living through what he lived through then, as some of the other survivors have done exactly the same, and putting it in the context of what we're going through today, for me is extremely, extremely heartwarming and motivating and all I can say is that if we could um, take on board the messages that the survivors pass on to us, that will be the internal legacy that we take with us um, for many, many years to come. So listening to Richard's outlook and the bright, the, looking at the bright side of, of life, that to me is the underlying message that I take away from this evening. I'd like to thank Richard for for his openness and sharing. I'd like to thank Mark Haber for sharing with us um, the photos and video clips. And I'd also obviously like to thank Jason, my co-colleague uh, on the March of the Living Committee of Management for putting this evening together and thank the audience for being here and taking part in this event. And I wish everybody Chag Samach, a wonderful Shana Tova, Khatimatova and a wonderful new year filled with ho with hope, health, and happiness. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for listening to me and for sharing my problems of yesterday. <laughs> thank you, Richard. Thank you. And Shana Tova to everybody.